Like the natural beauty of the ocean's tide, the dawn of the 1988 baseball season brought about its own picturesque setting. After all, what could be prettier to a baseball fan than the sight of players reporting for spring training? Indeed, these are images and sounds that conjure up a wondrous feeling. Let's go, get out there. When you stay inside, that's when your hands take over and you just react to the ball. The bat was right here, all you do is just drop it. Boom. There it goes. Hey! Who'll be the heroes? And who'll catch our imaginations or draw the most attention? The reaction is the... Mm. 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 Oh, that's a homer. We'll take a bird's eye view of baseball's lighter moments. What is your daddy's name, Brianna? Alex. Alex, and what is your daddy's name? David. Dave Anderson, my goodness. Do you love Uncle Tom? Yeah. Great, Uncle Tom loves you too. I'm Chili Davis, owner of Chili's Restaurant, Dennis's Chili, and a whole band of Chili. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Have a wonderful year. Come on out and watch the angels beat the A's. <laughs> beat the A's. <laughs> So gather around the TV set, y'all, as we look back at the year in baseball, 1988. In April, fans flocked to the ballparks on opening day. And at Dodger Stadium, the formalities were dispensed with rather quickly by second baseman Steve Sachs. That marked the beginning of a very special year for the Dodgers. And for George Bell of the Toronto Blue Jays, opening day was also a blast. George became the first major leaguer in baseball history to belt three homers on the first day of the year. And Darryl Strawberry of the Mets welcomed in 1988 by blasting a ball into orbit. Strawberry shot traveled an estimated 525 feet and might have traveled plumb out of Olympic Stadium, but for the roof. Reliever Dennis Eckersley of the Oakland Athletics started the season doing what he does best. He picked up a save, the first of a major league leading 45. Also on opening day, the turnstiles turned at a record rate. Opening day drew over 400,000 fans across the country. But the big talk was balk talk. Pitchers having trouble adhering to the stricter balk rule. A balk call, third balk of the afternoon called against Roger Clemens. That's a balk. Yes, indeed. That's two. Here's a ball. Well, hey, a ball, cattle boy. Oh, my. Here we go with the balk rule. Dave Stewart is saying, no, I didn't. They call the balk. Here it is again. This balk rule is going to turn into a farce in 1988. Chuck Tanner didn't smile much after opening day. In fact, Atlanta had that run-down feeling from the very start. And when you're always a uh, run down, it's easy to get down in the dumps. An 0-7 start became a nightmare. He gets underneath it, and it's popped up for the third baseman, Oberkfell, in front of the mound. First baseman there, too. Oberkfell overruns it, and it drops. Unbelievable. Well, this is maybe the ultimate low point of the season. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Perry and Virgil are getting into it. You don't get to see this every day, folks. Two outs, a runner first. He's gone. Strike. Throw. Out. Game over. And the Braves have now lost nine in a row to start the year. They tie the National League record. They broke the record with their 10th loss the next day. But Zane Smith broke the dry spell with Atlanta's first victory. 
little too late for Chuck Tanner, who lost his job. And Russ Nixon was fingered as Tanner's replacement, but the numbers still didn't add up. This is like the free bar at the hospitality suite. Doubles and triples all over the place. Well, the Baltimore Orioles might have been driven to drink after their woeful start. Ball is hit to center field, and Lynn comes over and in and makes the dive, but does not get it. They got it. There goes, yep. They got it. Throw it out to Bell, and he's picked off. After an 0-for-6 start, Cal Ripken Sr. was fired, and new manager Frank Robinson stepped into the frying pan. But even as the Orioles dreamed of what it might be like to win a game, the nightmare continued. And under Robinson, Baltimore was a pitiful 0-15. <laughs> you know, one Baltimore disc jockey lost lots of sleep during the Orioles' rocky start. Our afternoon jock, Chris Emery, looked at me and said, you know, if they don't win, you ought to stay on the air until they do. Um, <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time. I figured it'd last a day or two. And White hits a drive to left. Stone coming in, and he loses it in the lights. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in Baltimore, there's a disc jockey who desperately wants the Orioles to win a ball game. <laughs> yeah. He's been on the air for six days, apparently. Said he's going to stay on the air until the Orioles won. 98 rocking hour number 184. Hey, Fly ball down the left field line. Going to be a long run for Gladney. Makes the grab. And the streak continues. 21 consecutive losses. But the Orioles' losing streak mercifully ended in Chicago against the White Sox. Ground ball, this should be it. Stanisek, make sure he's got it. And ladies and gentlemen, at 21, the streak is history. The Orioles certainly gained lots of attention because of their losing ways. And just a few days after the streak ended, 50,000 Oriole fans showed up to support their team. Morgana, the kissing bandit, showed her support by supplying Cal Ripken Jr. with some powerful inspiration. Mm. In the National League, Cincinnati manager Pete Rose made headlines after a hotly contested game against the Mets. Mookie Wilson's grounder caused a close play at first, and a delayed call by the umpire helped New York score their go-ahead run in the ninth inning. Then, Rose and first base umpire Dave Pallone really went toe-to-toe. -to -toe. When push turned to shove, Pallone threw Rose out of the game, and Pete was handed a 30-day suspension. How about that? In other April news, it rained at Dodger Stadium. Yes, sir, for the first time in history, Los Angeles was submerged for three straight rainouts. Slugger Mike Schmidt participated in an equally unusual occurrence. Well, there's another ball. It scoots over near the Phillies' dugout, and this ball is going to try to, it stays on the lip, and Schmidt's going to try to come home. Nobody's covering. Oh, my goodness. The New York Mets flat fell asleep. I have never in my life seen that. Here's a hot one. Mets coach Bill Robinson with a hot foot. And how about the hot seat at Yankee Stadium? Hurry up, guys, before it spreads. But the hottest Yankee in April was Dave Winfield. By the end of the month, Dave was hitting 405 with 27 runs batted in. He also authored a best-selling book to boot. The merry month of May wasn't so merry after all. Padre manager Larry Boa lost his cool and his job after the Padres lost 17 out of 21. New manager Jack McKeon, the traitor, found an ace up his sleeve when he acquired pitching ace Dennis Rasmussen. Jack was also the Padres' general manager as he watched Rasmussen deliver a 16-4 record. And as a result, the Padres posted one of the best records in the National League during the second half of the season. 
and Padres outfielder Tony Gwynn captured his second batting title in two years. He did it with a 313 average. The Amazing Grace was the nickname given to Cubs rookie first baseman Mark Grace. Mark hit 296 while driving in some graceful runs for Chicago. In addition to Grace, the Cubs were also blessed with pitcher Greg Maddox. At one point, Maddox was the hottest pitcher in the majors, winning 15 of his first 18. Pittsburgh struck Pirate Gold when they acquired Barry Bonilla in 86, because in 88, Bonilla belted 24 homers and drove in 100 runs for the second place Pirates. And Chris Sabo of the Cincinnati Reds made the all-star team and ran off of the National League's Rookie of the Year honors. In the American League, Frank Viola was perfect. The fun-loving Minnesota Twins left-hander posted his best season yet, 24-7, with a 2.64 earned run average. It seemed like there was nothing that Viola couldn't do. After being the World Series MVP in 87, he captured the Cy Young in 88. Not bad for an encore. Dave Stewart of the Oakland A's. Man, he started the season like a ball of fire with a nine and nothing record. Overall, the ace of the A's staff posted a record of 21 wins and 12 losses. You know, that was the second straight year that he's won 20 games. Oakland's quick rise to the top of the standings has to be attributed in part to Dave Henderson's productive bat. Carney Lansford hit 444 in the month of May. And shortstop Walt Weiss solidified the infield with his stellar defensive play at shortstop. He also captured Rookie of the Year honors. Congratulations on a fine season, gentlemen. And now let's check our notebook for the month of May. The expressway to first place belonged to the Cleveland Indians in early May. The tribe was bolstered by strong starting pitching, spearheaded by Greg Swindell, who started the season 6-0. and Outfielder Joe Carter produced like an all-star, as did second baseman Julio Franco. There were also some rather strange occurrences. In Pittsburgh, Powerful wins delayed a game between the Pirates and Astros. And an overtime affair in St. Louis saw utility man Jose Akendo pitch four innings against the Braves. Jose even struck out a man in a losing effort. But this incident, which also involved the Braves, was even stranger. Andres Thomas on to Perry for out number two. A correction, out number three. Wait a minute. <laughs> there are only two outs, folks. <laughs> Hold everything here. Hold everything. <laughs> there are two men out. The, both clubs, both of them, all of them run off the field. Everybody thinks they be out. Oh, okay. I thought I was losing it there for a minute. I don't know how in the world that happened. Now let's lose May and move on to the dog days of June. Fans, it's true that baseball has its own share of shall I say, animal magnetism. There's the goose in Chicago, deer in Milwaukee, bats in Houston. <laughs> yes, sir. Baseball attracts all kinds of varmints, and some of them are for the birds, if you ask me. Here, birdie, 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 birdie. It took the ushers a while to get them in here, but once they found their tickets, well, they're, they're all out there. That'll close that section down for a while. We got another animal on the field this time, a cat. Whoa. There he goes. I'd give this about a 9-5 right here for difficulty alone. Look at it, right on his right head. His head. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to help Darrell Strawberry in right field. Doesn't it hurt to be a little squirrely to play this game? You know that. <laughs> and there is an uninvited guest to the ballpark today. 
pretty good speed. Gone. Right through the legs of Howland there. He ain't chicken. He's just checking the box scores. <laughs> Man alive, the game of baseball is just filled with surprises. Perhaps the biggest surprise of the, mm, that bird in foul ground at Dodger Stadium was the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Pirates pecked away at the New York Mets' lead in the National League East with a high-scoring offense led by the big bat of center fielder Andy Van Slyke. With his bat, Andy was a dandy. 25 homers and 100 RBIs. Just a spectacular two with his glove in center field. He got it. And speaking of got, how about Jim got? The Pirate relief pitcher ranked second in the league in saves with 34, and Pittsburgh proved that they're the team of the future. Baseball in the month of June was also filled with some eye-popping defensive footwork and outstanding razzle-dazzle with the glove. Why don't you just sit back and watch? Oh, what a play by Ramirez! Got him! Top liner! the catch. Ho oh, ho. Barry Hill chasing it, so is Grace. Whoa! Look oh. at that stop by Palmer. Unbelievable. Kettleton over near the stands, reaches, and does he have it? He falls into the stands, makes the catch. Up in the air. Oh, and a great catch by Anderson. This one might go. Washington to the wall. He leaps. And he made the catch! Well, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Oh, is that fun to watch? That ball's out of here. As a matter of fact, I think he caught it in the web and brought it back. And there's a drive up the alley in right center field. There's one of the great catches of the season right there, Gary Pettis. Brunanski to the gate, reaches up, he's got it! Brady Anderson, what a catch! Henderson coming over, jumps, and oh, makes the catch! Oh, he's got to be between his legs. <laughs> Way to go, Ellis. Bo Jackson back, leaps, and he makes the catch! Now it's time to check our news headlines for June. The sun came out in Chicago after the tenants of Comiskey Park, the Chicago White Sox, were granted subsidies for a new stadium by the Illinois General Assembly. As a result, the White Sox decided to stay in Chicago. Hey, they made him mighty happy. Whoever said it was impossible to steal first base? Well, looks like he decided to reposition it. Cincinnati Reds veteran Dave Concepcion augmented his groundskeeping efforts by pitching. The veteran infielder from the days of the Big Red Machine made the most of his opportunity by striking out Franklin Stubbs. <laughs> While an infielder pitched in the National League, Rick Roden became the first pitcher to start a game as a designated hitter in the American League. Rick drove in a run with a sacrifice fly. After another stormy stint as Yankee manager that included a fist fight and a dirt hurling incident with umpires, Billy Martin got the heave ho and was replaced for the second time in three years by Lou Pinella. But the Yankees still went limp. Now, for the case of the missing outfielder. They threw the first pitch. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that's what they get for going early on us. The center fielder, Devon White, was not even on the field. With the month of July came the Midsummer Night's Classic. Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati was the site of baseball's 59th All-Star Game. Vice President George Bush was on hand to throw out the game's first pitch. 
But catcher Terry Steinbach was the surprise candidate for MVP honors. The game proved to be a low-scoring affair with some defensive gems and the American Leaguers prevailed by a final score of 2-1. to one. It was the American League's 21st victory in the history of the game and their second All-Star celebration in a row. A quick look at the July standings show the Dodgers in first place in the National League West New York Mets in first by three and a half games in the National League East. In the American League West, the Oakland A's were in front of the pack, leading Minnesota by five and a half games. And the Detroit Tigers topped the charts in the American League East with the eventual winners in fourth place. When it was time to say hello to the second half, Sparky Anderson's Detroit Tigers were determined to maintain their grip on first place in the East. The surprising Tigers were a club that most observers predicted would bring up the rear. We have a saying here, we don't know where we'll finish when we start it, and nobody cares. I don't care, you don't care, but the one thing we do care about is how we go about this. We will play the best we can play every night. Sparky himself was staring a personal milestone in the eye when he won his 800th game as the Detroit Tigers manager. Anderson also won over 800 games as skipper of the Cincinnati Reds, making him the first manager in history to win 800 games in both leagues. But as the Detroit Tigers roared, the Boston Red Sox snored. Manager John McNamara's club played rather uninspiring ball in July. But just when it seemed the Sox had dropped out of the race for good, new life was instilled in the club by new manager Joe Morgan. The Sox snapped to attention, and their luck changed mighty quick. Well, I think the biggest thing was every, after every game we won, we went upstairs and we were watching Joe to see if he was betting on any horses or any dog races because we were going to bet right along with him. <laughs> Roger Clemens seemed like a sure bet each time he took the mound. K's were Rocket Roger's specialty as usual. He led the major leagues in strikeouts with 291. Bruce Hurst was perhaps the Red Sox most consistent pitcher, winning nine games in a row while achieving an 18 and six mark for the year. The Red Sox went on a red hot tear that included seven straight wins and a record 24 consecutive victories at home. Wade Boggs overcame personal problems to post a 366 batting average, good enough for a batting title, his fifth, while Mike Greenwell belted 22 homers and drove in 119 runs to keep Boston in the pennant race. A man who captured much acclaim in Cleveland was 31-year-old reliever Doug Jones. The journeyman pitcher collected an amazing 37 saves as the Indians' main stopper. He also attained this major league record at Yankee Stadium. Swing and a miss, strike three, and the game is over. Doug Jones has just set a new major league record. He has saved his 14 consecutive games. Minnesota Twins reliever Jeff Reardon accumulated 42 saves, making him the first to collect 40 or more saves in both leagues. The only man to outdo Reardon was Oakland A's relief ace Dennis Eckersley, who captured Relief Man of the Year honors with a major league leading 45 saves. He struck 
knock him out, and Dennis Eckersley has saved a big one for the Oakland A's. He's a great competitor. He was when he was a starting pitcher. He's got great poise and coolness, toughness in the, in the clutch. He's got the charisma. He's got the experience. He's got the coolness. He's a, he's a consummate professional. There's a lot more glory being a, the closer if you're doing a good job. I mean, you go out there, you pitch one inning, and you shake people's hands. So I've gotten the opportunity to shake a lot of hands this year. You were the king of the hill, Dennis. In July news, Nolan Ryan, the Major League's all-time strikeout king, won his 100th game in the National League, making him the only man to win 100 in both the National and American Leagues. Nolan won 100 in the American League with the Angels. And Tom Seaver, a man who once pitched on the same staff as Ryan, had his number 41 retired by the Mets. If you just allow me one moment, I'm going to say thank you in my own very special way. And if you know me, how much I love pitching, you'll know what it means to me. Congratulations, Tom Terrific. You are one of the best. Another all-time pitching great, Tommy John of the New York Yankees, won the 285th game of his career against the Brewers. He also committed three errors on one play in the same game. Error number one, throws the ball down the right field line. Error number two, cuts the ball off. Number three, a bad throw. A's relief pitcher Gene Nelson pulled a fast one when he decided to steal a base with Oakland slugger Jose Canseco at bat. He's going. Look at his bounce throw. Gene Nelson steals second base. Well, what do you know about that? <laughs> pitcher David Palmer of the Phillies only wished he looked half as good while advancing to third base on a bad pitch. <laughs> on a more serious note, Mike Schmidt of the Phillies passed Mickey Mantle on the all-time home run list for the 537. While three days later, rookie teammate Ricky Jordan homered in his first major league at bat. The Hall of Fame inducted a new member, former pirate great Willie Stargell. I am living proof that hard work earns just rewards. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and it is an honor. Thank you. Baseball made a change of biblical significance in the month of August. Twas in the beginning a place forever known as the kingdom of Chicago, and it did bear the many bountiful fruits of the lords of Wrigley. Then, as baseball's children overran the earth, the lords of Wrigley said, let there be natural grass. And there was. And the lords of Wrigley said, let there be ivy-covered walls. And there were. And they said, playeth only by the light of day. And they did. How about that? It came to pass that baseball shepherds and the Supreme Court of Illinois, too, bequeathed that man-made lights wash away the darkness of night. Great flocks of fandom cast their protests. But the end of an era came anyway, as the men of the word adorned themselves in pagan garments to pay tribute. The Philistines from the east waged battle against the protectors of Wrigley Shrine. Finally, it came to pass as a man of fourscore and eleven years cast away the evil spirits of the night and gave his offering unto the kingdom of Wrigley. And there was. Then from everywhere, people saw the lights and 
and saw that they were good. In the midst of the battle between the Philistines from the east and the protectors of the shrine, the skies opened. The real Lord caused torrents of water to cascade down as the oceans covered the top of and Wrigley's ministry frolicked in the waters. But the keepers of the rule book deemed this night could not be the night. Someone said it earlier in the clubhouse during the rain delay that uh, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of like the good Lord said, uh, you know, I'm going to show you how I feel about tonight's game, too. And so the evening passed. And on the second night, the gladiators tried again. And they were glad. The mighty metropolitans who came like the Romans were thrown into a den of lions, I mean cubs. Thus they were defeated. And the protectors of the land of Wrigley reveled was a victory that made Chicago joyous. But Davy Johnson and the Mets, well, that's another story. They fell prey again when they lost two games to the Padres that cut their lead to only three and a half. Meanwhile, the Los Angeles Dodgers were building their own momentum. Gibson cuts to third. He's going to try to score. The play at the plate. He scores, and the ball game is over. When the Dodgers traded Pedro Guerrero to the Cardinals for pitcher John Tudor, they seemingly bolstered their playoff chances. But when a packed house gathered at Dodger Stadium, Keith Hernandez ignited the slumbering Mets. Marshall back! And Dwight Gooden improved his record to 15 and 6 with an eight strikeout complete game performance. Tommy Lasorda's troops fared no better the next night as David Cohn held the Dodgers to one run in a 5 to 1 victory. Cohn turned out to be New York's most consistent pitcher in 88. The next night, the Mets tallied a three-game sweep in Los Angeles that helped them roar on to the National League Eastern Division Championship. <laughs> hey, wake up, buddy. We got more exciting baseball action to work out. There's a long drive to deep left field. He has a chance or so like at the hole. <laughs> She's got a future, but I don't know about this guy. Hey, look out, buddy. Oh, man. What a mess. Hey, look out. There goes your drink. Wow. Weird, ain't it, man? Ah, oh, boom. Now for some August news. Pitcher Mark Gubas of the Kansas City Royals had a spectacular August and a fantastic season for the Kansas City Royals. He was 20 and 8 with a 2.70 ERA. Bobby Witt of the Texas Rangers rebounded strong after a demotion to the minors. The Texas hurler pitched in nine straight complete games after never having thrown one prior to 1988. Congratulations, Bobby. 
Seattle pitcher Mike Moore had an amazing 16 strikeout performance against the Yankees at Yankee Stadium. And California Angels manager Cookie Rojas was thrown out of the game by three different umpires at the same time. And now it's time to head into the September home stretch. An American leaguer who stood mighty tall throughout the 1988 season was Oakland A's slugger Jose Canseco, a man some consider the most talented player ever. Amazing. Look at the strength. This big guy is having that MVP kind of year. Not too many people could argue with that. In 1988, Jose compiled some impressive numbers. He hit a major league leading 42 homers and led the majors by driving in 124 runs. Oakland's power man hit for average, too, a hearty 307. He also set his sights on the 4040 club, a club so exclusive that it had no members. Basically, I thought if I just stay consistent and use my ability and didn't go into any slumps, that I can make the 40-40 club. What I didn't realize is that there are no members in the 40-40 club, so I sort of just laughed at that. No members, that is, until Jose stole his 40th base against the Brewers. He's running! A's manager Tony La Russa even gave Canseco a standing ovation for becoming the first player ever to hit 40 homers and steal 40 bases. And believe me, words of praise come easy when talking about Mr. Jose Canseco. He's one of the best. A rainy September evening in Cincinnati was the backdrop for a super pitching performance by Reds hurler Tom Browning. It happened on September 17th, to be exact. And after a two hour and 27 minute rain delay, Browning smothered the Los Angeles Dodgers for nine innings. He struck out seven to carry a perfect game into the ninth. And now it's two outs, and it's two strikes to the batter, Tracy Woodson. And now Tom Browning makes his bid for perfection. And Tom Browning has pitched a perfect game. 27 outs in a row, and he is being mobbed by his teammate. Interestingly enough, Browning had another no-hitter broken up in the ninth inning against the Padres earlier in the year. But in 88, that wasn't so unusual. Nolan Ryan of the Astros had a no-hitter broken up in the ninth inning of a game against the Phillies. Base hit center field. Nolan Ryan's lost his no-hitter. Gross will stop at second base. Line drive into left field. Base hit. A looping line drive to left by Wallace Johnson. And Ron Robinson loses his perfect game with two outs in the ninth inning. Two-two pitch on the ground. Shortstop grabs it up with it. Can't make the play, and there's a base hit. And there goes the no-hitter up in smoke. Oh, man. Base hit. Ron Washington... Knocks Odell Jones out of the record book. They're on their feet in the Astrodome. I like looking at the little kids, eight, ten years old, who might be seeing history. Something they'll never forget. Line right field. It's a base hit, and the no-hitter is history. Obertfell hit it hard. Nothing fluky about it. A swing and a bounce in a second. Big hop. As if once is not enough, Steve was in a similar situation in a game against the Orioles. A swing and a shot down the right field line at the base hit. And there goes another no-hit hit for Dave Steve. 
And finally, Pascual Perez of the Montreal Expos was working on a no-hitter, but unfortunately for Perez, the game was shortened by rain to just five innings. As the pennant battle raged on in September, clear-cut victories were decided in three of the four divisions. Despite the hard-fought efforts of the Cincinnati Reds, the team that emerged victorious out west, Tommy Lasorda's Los Angeles Dodgers, who won by a comfortable seven-game margin. The New York Mets won the National League East with a 15-game cushion over Pittsburgh. And the Oakland A's won the American League West with the best record in baseball. The only battle that remained open, the American League East, where the race remained up in the air because of Boston's inability to beat the Blue Jays. Despite the Red Sox success against the rest of the American League, Toronto had Boston's number. In fact, the Blue Jays beat the Sox seven straight times at Fenway and 11 times in 13 games. Here's another one. Just follow this one. Out of here. Two-run homer, Ernie Witt. 9-0. As a result, the Milwaukee Brewers remained alive, three games out and only three to play. The Yankees were still in contention as well, even after Boston's Mike Boddicker pitched a complete game shutout against the Indians. So here's how the circumstances unfolded the very next night. The magic number is one, and tonight here in Cleveland, the Red Sox can wrap up the 1988 American League East Division title outright with a win over the Indians in game two of this four-game series. And the fact that you've got Roger Clemens going out there, a team that has never beaten Roger Clemens, let alone any place. As a matter of fact, this year, they have just four hits off Roger Clemens, so I kind of like Joe Morgan and, and the Red Sox chances here. They have just put it up on the board now, first inning, Tribe leading the Red Sox 3-zip. Ground ball out in front of it. Look at this. Bounces over Mattingly's head. I'm a son of a gun. Here comes Sheridan. He'll score. And the Tigers lead it 2 to nothing. Little flare in the right field as Lemon comes on. He makes the catch. The ball game is over. And the Yankees have been eliminated. Burks the runner at second. Romine at first. Two outs, top of the ninth. Cleveland four, Boston two. That should end the ball game. Mel Hall. Swung on. There's a hard drive. Way back. Center field. Going. It's gone. Ken Seiko crushes. Home run number 42. Ace three. Brewers one. Ground ball to the right. Lansford has it at first, steps on the bag. The A's win their 103rd. The Red Sox are the American League Eastern Division champions. With both the Brewers and Yankees losing, Boston had officially clinched the American League East. Meanwhile, a Dodger pitcher was trying to write his name into the record books, Oral Hershiser. After he'd allowed a run-scoring base hit by Dave Martinez at the Montreal Expos on August 30th, it marked the beginning of a monumental accomplishment. Tim Raines scored, but after that, Hirschheiser went on to hold his opponent scoreless for the month of September. Oral retired 16 straight batters in Atlanta, holding the Braves to no runs and a complete game victory that increased his scoreless inning streak to 13. The Braves jeopardized that streak on August 14th when they loaded the bases with two men out, but Hirschheiser delivered again. In high and deep to left field, Gibson going back on the warning track he had just enough room. Again, flirting with a grand slam, and Hirschheiser has done it again. 
Then there was talk of Hirschheiser surpassing Don Drysdale's record of 58 consecutive scoreless innings. If you recall, Drysdale's streak had a controversial edge added to it when Don hit San Francisco's Dick Dietz with a pitch. Home plate umpire Harry Wendelstadt called Dietz out for not trying to get out of the way. Amazingly enough, Oral Hershiser also received a favorable call. It was in a game against the Giants. take a one to nothing lead and they call the interference play and the inning is over the inning is over and take the run away and the scoreless inning streak is still alive Hershiser tied the record with nine scoreless innings against the Padres then with the scoreless deadlock going into the tenth Oral broke Drysdale's mark as Keith Moreland flied out to right field And Hershiser was congratulated by Drysdale himself. Other September news included the bat of Minnesota's Kirby Puckett. Kirby finished the season with a 357 average, highest for a right-handed batter since 1941. Minnesota also became the first American League city to draw over three million fans. Kansas City's George Brett also finished the season on a powerful note. George ended the year with 24 homers, 103 RBIs, and a 306 average. Congratulations, George, and congratulations, too, to Will Clark of the Giants, who blasted 29 homers and captured the National League RBI crown with 109. And 41-year-old Darrell Evans of the Tigers achieved an important personal milestone when he hit career home run number 400. Danny Jackson of the Cincinnati Reds won his 20th game of the season against the Chicago Cubs. He also helped himself by going four for five. Jackson and Oral Hershiser ended the season with identical records. 23 and 8. Jackson's teammate, reliever John Franco, was the National League's top save specialist. He turned in 39. Montreal's Randy Johnson became the tallest pitcher in history at 6 foot 10. And finally, how about Ronald Reagan's appearance at Wrigley Field? The president also stopped by to do an inning of play-by-play. And it will strike, swinging and it's out. And that retires the side. Three out and the man dies on third base. Well, good to see you and thank you for letting me sit in here and do this. Time now for the year in baseball's playoff picture and the month of October. The Red Sox boasted of a lineup of some heavy hitters. But in facing a team like the youthful and talented A's, manager Joe Morgan had a difficult task at hand. Oakland trimmed Boston down to size in game one when Dave Stewart held the Sox to one run through six and a third. Dennis Eckersley finished, striking out Wade Boggs, and Oakland won the opener two to one. Game two, Jose Canseco homers, and the A's won it four to three. Then the series moved to Oakland for game three. Boston's Mike Greenwell homered in the second, and the Sox led five to nothing. Ron Hassey homered in the third, and Oakland roughed up Mike Boddicker for six. The A's completed the sweep in game four and made their way to the World Series. The National League playoff scene was Hollywood, but the series opener was scripted in New York's favor. Oral Hershiser held the Mets to only two runs through eight and a third. 
Keith Hernandez directed encouragement from the bench as New York's leading man stepped center stage. Gary Carter faced reliever Jay Howe, two outs in the ninth. Base hit. Strawberry scored to tie the game, and Kevin McReynolds raced home like a raging bull as New York won. David Cohn of the Mets started game two of the series, but a base hit by Mickey Hatcher in the second inning brought Los Angeles to life. Steve Sachs scored, and the Dodgers evened the series at one game apiece. Game three was postponed due to rain. But the next day, with the field still slippery and wet, Kirk Gibson made a spectacular catch. How about that? Innings later, umpires found pine tar in the glove of reliever Jay Howell. Bart Giamatti inspected the glove, and the Dodgers' top reliever was suspended as the Mets won the ball game. Game four, Mike Socia smashed a Dwight Gooden pitch over the right field fence in the ninth inning to tie the ball game. The Dodgers took the lead when the Mets gave up a homer to Kirk Gibson in the 12th. Oral Hershiser relieved in the 12th. Game over, and the Dodgers tied the series at two games apiece. Sid Fernandez hammered by Kirk Gibson in game five. And New York trailed three games to two. Dodger Stadium. Mets starter Dave Cohn even the series at three games apiece with a five hitter. But Tommy Lasorda's relentless Dodgers exploded in game seven. Steve Sachs helped break the game open in the second, and Los Angeles led six to nothing. Hershiser was on the mound to close the game out in the ninth. The New York Mets were eliminated, and the amazing Los Angeles Dodgers had earned themselves some mighty big headlines. The 1988 World Series, strictly a California affair. Los Angeles against Oakland. Most experts ticketed the A's as favorites, but in game one, Tommy Lasorda's team displayed the heart of a true champion. Perhaps Mickey Hatcher symbolized that spirit best when he spearheaded the Dodger attack with a first inning home run. Hatcher's homer gave Los Angeles a two to nothing lead. The Dodgers' vision of a big win turned for the worse when Oakland A's slugger Jose Canseco connected with the bases loaded. A grand slam home run. With Oakland heading into the ninth leading by a four to three margin, the stage was set for some Hollywood heroics. An injured Kirk Gibson hobbled to the plate with two outs and one man aboard. Gibson swings, it's going, going, and it is gone. The Dodgers win with a dramatic bottom of the ninth inning blast by Kirk Gibson. How about that? one of the most exciting finishes in World Series history. Oh, Roy Hobbs himself couldn't have done better. After snaring the series opener, the Dodgers greeted game two of the series with the momentum clearly in their favor. The man they looked up to all season long contributed again, but this time with his back. Hirschheiser went three for three and drove in a run as the Dodgers forged ahead six to nothing. A three hit shutout for the amazing Mr. Hirschheiser and the Dodgers led the series by two games to zip. 
The Dodgers then took their show on the road. Game three, score tied at one all, and the A's batting in the ninth inning. Two balls, two strikes, one out. The batter, Mark McGuire. Howell delivered, swung on, a drive deep to left field. It's going, going, and it is out of here. The first homer Jay Howell had given up to a right-handed batter in 1988. Mark was sure on the mark, and the A's breathed a sigh of relief. Game four. Dodger starter Tim Belcher struck out seven athletic batters in six and two-thirds innings, and Los Angeles held on to a one-run lead. With Oakland fans getting jittery in the ninth, Jay Howell faced Dave Parker. Parker popped the ball up in the foul territory for out number three. The Dodgers won game four of the series and led three games to one. Game five. Former A's greats, Raleigh Fingers, Reggie Jackson, and Gene Tennis in a pregame ceremony. But it was journeyman ball player Mickey Hatcher who did the damage and the Dodgers jumped out to a two to nothing advantage. In the fourth, with the Dodgers leading two to one, former A's player Mike Davis delivered a home run. Mike's blast gave the Dodgers a four to one lead and that was more than Oral Hershiser needed. The Cy Young Award winner struck out nine. Oral Hershiser, the MVP of the National League Championship Series and on his way to the World Series MVP, held Oakland's powerful hitters at bay. And to complete the dream, Oral Hershiser was on the mound for the last out. Yes, the Los Angeles Dodgers were the world champions of 1988. The team with the best record in baseball walked away a loser. Perhaps the story of 1988 can be thought of as a fairy tale. But a fairy tale that came true. We knew it was one in a million. It was such a long shot But somehow We got here together And who knows what will happen Anything can happen Anything can happen 